Okay, so uh, let's go then. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing I'd like you to take a note of is this book, and it's by Leslie Keane, and she calls it Surviving Death, and it's a journalist investigates evidence for an afterlife. Now, the interesting thing about it is that she is a highly competent journalist, and she wrote this book really asking the question, do we survive death? And she gives a lot of evidence for it. And so I recommend it to you very highly. So the plan for my talk is I'm going to do existential death anxiety because it's actually very important, particularly now with COVID. And then I'm going to give you new information about death as an expansion of consciousness. Did you all copy that? Yes, as an expansion of consciousness, not a reduction of consciousness. And then a little bit on the similarity between death and NDEs and with a lot of uh, personal accounts. So um, let's, uh, oh yes, you will, and I mean you, will die. So why on earth I started this lecture by saying that? Because I have changed you by pointing out to you that we're all mortal and going to die. Because we forget about the importance of existential death anxiety, how it can change our behavior, which it really does. I mean, how many of you in a party are going to go up to somebody and say, um, well, I think I'll be buried there, or maybe I'll go and be burnt. So let me just give you some evidence to support that. This is the role of death in life, and it's The Worm at the Core. It's a very good book, actually, by Sheldon Solomon, Jeff Greenberg, and Tom Sysinski. And um, I recommend it if you're interested in this. So I'm going to show one of their experiments, which they wrote up in this book. So they wanted to know if being reminded of death changed your behavior. So two groups were formed and selected by questionnaire to be the same in personality. They were all judges. One half were given just the questionnaire. And the other had an additional question. How long do you think you will live? Now that's all. Otherwise, they're straightforward questionnaires. Both groups were asked to judge a minor crime, a prostitute found working the streets. So the judgment. Now, these were all judges. Do keep that in mind. The average fine for that crime at the time was 50 pounds. That was the baseline. In the first group, where the judges were not asked to think about their mortality or had been reminded of it, they set an average fine of 50 pounds. So good judges, they knew what to do. But look at this. Both groups had been asked about their mort, but the group who had been asked about their mortality first set a bond that was nine times higher. Amazing, actually, that one's behavior can be changed like this. 450 pounds. And what's amazing are two things. One is that judges are supposedly trained to administer the law evenly and rationally. So if any of you find yourself in court, don't ask the judge how long he's going to live. And secondly, when the experiment was explained to them, the second group all said, no way your stupid little questionnaire could have had any effect on my behavior, but it has. So I'm just going to follow that a little bit further. Because whenever people are reminded of death, they love people who share their beliefs. You might think of what we are in COVID, in fact, where, where there's a lot of death. So you, they love people who share their beliefs. They hate people who are different, and we've seen that. They sit closer to people who share their beliefs. They sit further away from anyone who looks different. And if we give such people in the laboratory setting an op opportunity to physically harm someone, who's different, they become much more hostile and vicious. They choose charismatic leaders. Does that resonate with you? 
And this can be seen at the present time in our society, and I think that's correct. So existential uh, fear of death really radiates throughout our world. Is there a way around this? Well, there is, in fact, uh, Bhutan, a wonderful Himalayan kingdom where death is not hidden in any sense. It's not like us in our culture where um, death is something which we all fear and don't look at. They, all the iconography and everything is uh, changed. Uh, they, the Bhutanese don't sequester death. And images of death are everywhere, especially in Buddhist iconography, where you'll find colorful, gruesome illustrations. Not one, not even children are sheltered from these images or the ritual dances reenacting death. So there's a, a society which is happy with death. And it's been calculated that if you get five reminders a day that you're going to die, then you lose your existential fear of death. Well, this is quite fun. This is a telephone app called We Croak. And it will go off five times a day reminding you of death. So if any of you want to be reminded of death five times a day, we croak, we'll do it for you. And in fact, they even brought out a handbook for being temporary. So uh, we have to be aware that the talking or thinking about death alters our behavior. The Dalai Lama certainly had something to say about this. Does ignoring death have consequences for us? Oh yes, he says it does. Those who reject death, in other words, I'm going to go on living, I'm not worried about death, that sort of attitude, suffer from a false set of sense of permanence. They become more greedy, more self-serving and lustful, have more enemies, and they become attached to my wealth, my health, my friends, <laughs> my enemies, and my family. If you're not permanent, it is actually much more difficult to have enemies because it's all going to come to an end anyway. So this talk is not about the physical phenomena of the dying body. It is about the mental states of the dying, what the dying may expect and what they could learn to help the proof process go more smoothly. So we're all attached to life and we won't face death. In our culture, we fear death and shut it out. We still do not understand and have only just started to study the subjective processes of dying. You would think that was amazing, but it's true. There are very few studies of the phenomena surrounding the time of death. There is uncertainty about whether such phenomena are spiritual or organic in origin, but in fact, does it matter? Many carers feel that they lack training in how to respond when told about these phenomena, and that is a crying shame. So what are these phenomena? So let's look at it. Um, this I made up, which is, uh, reminds us really of, uh, of the process of dying. Premonitions, you all remember premonitions. Um, We've got some nice stories of premonitions. Well, not so nice stories, in fact. There's one where a man, aged 27, with a small family, um, two children, two small children, told his wife that he was going to die because he had, in fact, accomplished everything that was required. He got his affairs in order and was really just waiting. And two months later, his company sent him out in a private plane to Africa, which crashed and he died. Um, one of the, I think, most terrible premonitions, terrible in the sense that it left uh, the mother intensely guilty. Many of you will remember Abafan when the tip slid down over the school. And this is one story from that time. This mother, uh, was seeing her children off to school the morning it was going to happen. And her daughter said to her, Mom, I had a dream last night that something black covered the school and I don't want to go in. Oh, don't be silly, my girl, said the mother. 
please, mum, I do not want to go to school. And the mother, of course, persuaded her to go to school because how could she know it was a premonition? And in fact, it was that very day that the tip fell on the school. So premonitions do occur. Now, we come to about a fortnight before death. And here you get deathbed visions. Um, I'll go into these in more detail. This is just to give you a picture of uh, what the actual journey to death is like. So deathbed visions, and they're there to help you and look after you. Then you go in and out of a new reality, which is full of love and life and support. Um, some people just before death will um, suddenly sit up and uh, say goodbye to the family if they're there and then lie back and die. Uh, clocks, animals, bells, lights, and shapes leaving the body are all seen. Another interesting one is this one, which is uh, deathbed coincidences. This is when the dying person goes to somebody to whom they are emotionally attached uh, to say that they're okay. So um, that's the general pattern of it. But that guy, he's far too aggressive. Death is not like that. It's much more like this. In fact, uh, you'll find that uh, when, when we all go through it, that guy much more represents the process. Um, this is 2016. You see, they're fairly recent. Uh, this is a book by Wollian. Uh, uh, from North America. And what he really, he talks about a lot of things, but he says the last hours of life are not easily explained within the traditional medical model. The most consistent caregivers, nurses, assess, recognize, and validate the experiences. And those are the experiences that I've talked to you about. Here's a professor of palliative care in Leeds. Uh, he's left now again, 214. And he talks about what it's like to die. And he points about, points to the fact that we can also feel courage, love, hope, reminiscence, transcendence, transformation, and even happiness as we die. And that gives us a, a totally different picture of what dying actually is. One of the uh, most interesting people, I think, is Monica Rents, and I'm going to refer to her work later, later on. She's written a book called Hope and Grace, and it's spiritual experiences in severe distress, illness, and dying. And Amazon will give you some of those if you'd like it. So it's Monica Rents, Hope and Grace. This is our book which of course I recommend very highly. Um, and I recommend it highly because I haven't seen another book like it that gives so many accounts from people who are in the dying process. It's really a new Ars Moriende Bene. So the art of dying with many, many examples of what people say as they come up to die. Uh, Here's a brochure, which is nearing the end of life, a guide to relatives and friends of the dying. And Sue Brain and myself wrote this, and we got a grant from the AIM Foundation. We sent it free to every hospice and every trust uh, in the country. And if, if you want the uh, PDF, I can, I can give it to you. Or if you want it bound neat, so it looks exactly like this then of course uh, you can get it from Amazon. I think it costs you a pound or one pound 50 or something. Those of you who want to see uh, a deathbed visitor, well, not a visitor, but somebody who has seen one might like to look at YouTube and Dr. Kerr in a TEDx in Buffalo uh, has a woman who speaks very warmly and nicely about one of her deathbed visitors. So let's look at these then. End of life experiences. Um, uh, you get the diagnosis, it's terminal, you're going to die. You start the dying process, 
and you're usually unprepared. So we set out to find the nature of end of life experiences. We interviewed the carers of the dying started in 2003. Now that was a, an amazing time because uh, I applied for ethics committee to interview the dying. And the ethics committee looked at it and said, Peter, we think it's too early for you to talk to the dying because you may upset them. But what we recommend is that you do a carer's study. So ask the carers. And that was brilliant for us. I didn't realize that it was so brilliant because the carers have a lot of experience. And we learned uh, one very important thing. And that is, if you ask a consultant in a, in, a, in a hospice, tell me, do any of these things occur? They say no. No, not really. We don't see them. They're talked about, but no, we don't see them. But ask the nurses. And it's quite different. In fact, we gave some of our results to one of the hospices where we've been talking to the nurses. And the consultant in charge said to me, uh, Peter, did you get your slides mixed up? And I said, no, I don't think so. Why? He said, we, well, these things don't happen in our hospice. And I said, yes, they do. And that's what I was talking about. So very interesting. So what did we do? Five-year retrospective and one-year prospective study, England, Holland, and Ireland, 110 carers questioned to begin with, one palliative care team, two English and three Dutch hospices, one nursing home, one Irish hospice study. But the most important thing, this actually has now gone up to over 1,500 emails and accounts from the public. So you've got a huge database there. And we interviewed doctors, nurses, auxiliary staff, chaplains, and volunteers. So the present consensus is that about 90% of those dying consciously will have an end of life experience, the sort of things I've been talking to you about. When we, um, when we first went into the field, there are only about two or three papers on it, apart from Barrett's book, which I'll mention. Um, so you could be a world authority by reading two papers. Uh, I'm so pleased to say that it's not like that now, and many other people have, in fact, um, gone into the field to study the dying process in, in a better way. I joined my daughter after an hour at the hospital. We both sat chatting to my mother. She spoke to me about my life, and my future, all interspersed with references to these people who are now at the end of her bed. She told us she wouldn't be there the next day and listen, as these people would pick her up when she fell and take her on a journey. We were slightly spooked at her comments, but she was totally at ease. She insisted that we shouldn't cry when she died. Now, uh, people who get their deathbed visitors, in fact, uh, get a lot of comfort from them. And deathbed visitors often sit on the bed. Why? Because uh, those of you who've had sick children know exactly why. It's enormously comforting to sit on the bed of a child and hold their hand. And in essence, this is what the deathbed visitors do. So who are the visitors? Well, um, we took 102 people and 118 visions. So this is 118 visions. Parents of the commonest in a quarter. Persons unknown, usually thought to be spiritual, 17%. And they have people who they greet with a joyful response, clearly know about 14%. And other relatives, 14. Spouses, 14. And so it goes on down. And I'm afraid that there are very few angels seen in this country. Uh, and not many friends come. Now, if you were to go to the Bible Belt of uh, North America, there I spoke to John Lerner, who's in a palliative care hospice, and he says there angels are very common. So if you want angels, go to the south of North America. What about your dog or your cat? No, one or two, but not many. So 
this guy has got it absolutely right. I thought it was going to be my mom. And indeed, that's exactly what it is. So let's go on down the line as we come closer to death, moving to a new reality. Uh, I was first of all learned about this from a mother whose daughter uh, was uh, 32 years old when she died of breast cancer. I was sitting on a beach in Jamaica, and so you can see it would have made quite an impression. And she said that in the last two to three days, her daughter was conscious. There was a dark roof over her head and a bright light. She moved into a waiting place where beings were talking to her, there to help her. Everything will be okay. They were loving beings, not a dream, and Gramps among them. And she moved in and out of this area. Now, just look at that for a moment. She went into a place where there was a bright light and um, uh, the beings there were talking to her. Other people give really quite a good description of this. And here's another one. My father was at his, my grandfather's bedside, deeply distressed. But my grandfather said to my father, uh, don't worry, Leslie. I'm all right. Sorry about that. It's my phone. I'm all right. I can see and hear the most beautiful things, and you must not worry. And he quietly died lucid to the end. Okay, did you understand that? He said, don't worry, Leslie. I'm all right. I can see and hear the most beautiful things, and you must not worry. And he quietly died lucid to the end. So that gives us a very different picture of what dying is life. And it, it's like that in, in, in a number of cases. Next one, terminal lucidity, which I mentioned, which the Victorians called lightening up before death. Now, Sir Henry Halford, a long serving president of the Royal College of Physicians wrote, we've all observed the mind clear in an extraordinary manner in the last hours of life. That's 1833. And this clearing of the mind is very important. And I'm so pleased to tell you that the National Institute of Health in America has given the, a colleague and great friend of mine, Sam Ponia, a grant to study it. Because consider this, uh, these people usually are unconscious. They come out of, uh, come out of unconsciousness into full consciousness. Many of them have been demented for years and years, yet they recognize their family, are able to talk, and some of them have strokes, so they haven't moved for a year or so, and they sit up. So there's something very strange going on there. And the question we have to ask ourselves, is, is mind indeed in the brain at all? And what is the relation between uh, mind and the body? So uh, it's, it's an interesting question. So if any of you are interested, um, there's an extremely good paper here uh, by uh, Michael Nam and Bruce Grayson in the Journal of Mental Disease in 2009, 81 cases, 49 case report with very good reference. And if any of you are neuroscientists, it makes a central reading. So let's go back again and think more about this. The diagnosis, then we start the journey and all this is deathbed visions. And this is the most interesting one. You go into this new reality, which is what? Full of love and light. Some people describe it as a waiting area, and some people um, say that they are being prepared for the next step. Then you come back again into, into the hospice, and you may do this three or four times, so you're sort of introduced to what's going to happen. And your consciousness changes do remember this, you go into what's called non-dual consciousness. And non-dual consciousness means that your egoic self is crumbling, but more of that later. If you want, 
and uh, there is somebody who hasn't come to say goodbye, you can go anywhere in the world and meet this person and give them a message. And the message is always, I'm okay, please don't worry. We've had people who've uh, deathbed coincidences from under the Atlantic Ocean in a submariner. Uh, his grandfather went to see him when he said goodbye. Uh, son, another one is a son in, in the UK. Uh, the relative in Australia, his mother. And uh, he went to see his mother. And what, what, uh, she noticed it was she saw her son coming towards her wasn't sure if it was a dream or whether it was real but he was uh dripping wet and she thought that's strange and then as he came towards her and this again is another part of the phenomenon he came more and more into the light until he got close to her and then he said it's all right mum don't worry about me because I'm okay. And the next morning when she rang up, she found that her son had been drowned. So they're interesting experiences. And uh, more about consciousness later, but animals howl at a distance. We've got some nice stories of dogs howling and cats are going around the room. Clock stop. Many of you may have been to Pierce Bridge in Yorkshire. Um, where the clock, which the American wrote the story about, my grandfather's clock stopped dead, never to go again, song actually, uh, is there and you can still see it. Then light is fascin fascinating because it can be little uh, punctate lights like lamps, like candles. It can be uh, balls of light or round orbs of light. And in some people, it can in fact be a transcendent light. And then uh, the other thing is you see shapes leaving the body. I've gotten some nice examples of that. One was a GP on the golf course, saw his, uh, uh, the person in the four in front of him suddenly collapsed. As he rushed over to see what the problem was, he saw this shape coming up. And another one when a man and his mate were cutting down trees and one fell on, on one of them and killed him. And again, the other reported seeing shapes leaving the body. So um, there's this transformation of consciousness at death into non-duality. So we'll talk more about it. But what I want you to understand is that your consciousness changes uh, as you die. So uh, transformation of consciousness experienced by 90% of the dying, the world they go into is very like the near-death experience world, light, love, and compassion, wholeness and feelings of unity, as I said, a waiting area with spiritual beings. And in that area, you also see your dead relatives. Here's an example. My life partner died of an AIDS-related pneumonia at home in 1991. I spent the last week lying beside him at home much of the time. And on one or two occasions, a look of sheer ecstasy lit up his face as he smiled and looked at something I couldn't see. So there you have it. Um, so, uh, I want to now go on to um, Monica Renz's work, R-E-N-Z, and she's uh, written a couple of books about it. She is a palliative care theologian, and she lives in Zurich, and she, uh, she um, uh, has done a number of studies about the dying process. And I'd just like to show you this. Now, that's my email address, peterfenick at compuserve.com. And if any of you want the paper I'm going to talk about, send it uh, to me at that address, but I'll put it up at the end for you too. 
Uh, so this is Monica Wrench, a new approach to physical power. Spirituality includes more than just giving a response to a patient's spiritual attitude. Spiritual needs, as well as patient's consciousness and communication, are changing during the dying process. The changing, in fact, is an expansion of consciousness. Spirituality uh, has to do with an altered connectedness in consciousness. We'll look a little bit more at that. In situations of suffering, illness, and dying, individuals often have spiritual experiences of grace and encounters with the transcendent or divine. This often happens when patients are in a state beyond their everyday consciousness. So again, uh, in her studies, she has seen people and followed them right up to the time of death. And her view that you get a change in consciousness, I'm sure, is correct. And she says spiritual experiences are powerfully independent of religious attitudes. You don't have to be religious to get this. You, um, and you can even believe that you're switched off when you die and you still go on just the same. So it doesn't matter what you believe or what you think. Um, the spiritual experiences that I've been talking about, you'll get them anyway. So let us examine the metric of dying uh, more closely. Monica talks about dying a transition. So what does that mean? She says there are three phases in dying, pre-transition, transition, and post-transition. And it, I think it's worth remembering this. And then, in pre-transition, patients may feel needs, uh, thirst, needs for bonding and emotions and joy. And the, the main thing is they may fear losing control and dignity and realize that dying is inevitable. Now, you can be locked in pre-transition, pre so please remember this. And that is that uh, what you need to do is clean. Pre-transition is a cleaning process. All your family issues should be resolved. You have to give up uh, your attachments to your family, to your house, to this world. Just give it up and be neutral. Sometimes you may become awareness of previous negative behavior. Now this is just not of interest to this process. So clean, clean, clean and, and give it up. Now then, as far as the carers are concerned, support and release, such as finding meaning, may help patients to move on. And I have actually some nice comments from different hospices on that. Now, transition itself, so this is one phase before you go into post-transition and death, implies the loosening of ego consciousness. What on earth is ego consciousness? Ego consciousness is your sense of I, not, not the universal I, a little I. Uh, ego consciousness are those thoughts and feelings which, which you have and which um, uh, you tell yourself stories. Oh, I don't like this because, etc. Those are all uh, egoic stories and those start to go. And uh, in transition, patients typically show physical signs of anxiety and struggle. Some patients may stir restlessly. And uh, if you haven't done your cleaning properly, traumas can be reinactivated. And now you come to post-transition, and this is a very important phase. And if you've kept yourself nice and clean, uh, this is what will happen. The ego isn't dominant anymore and you've entered a different level of consciousness, non-dual consciousness. You have become part of the world. There isn't an independent you looking at the world. You have become it. Patients seem to be serene in a state of being beyond anxiety, pain, or powerlessness. Most are unable to speak, but they can still hear, and this is important, and they communicate by gestures or single words. Sometimes reconciliation 
particularly with family members, visions and peace are observed. Such transformative experiences may be comparable to a spiritual awakening or a patient who has completed the journey. So this, in fact, is a spiritual opening, a spiritual awakening, and it's there for us. Uh, here's some examples of ours sent in by, uh, by or told by nurses or sent in by patients. Suddenly she stared intently up at the window. This lasted only minutes, but it seemed ages. She suddenly turned to me and said, please, Pauline, don't ever be afraid of dying. I've seen a beautiful light. I was going towards it and I wanted to go into that light. It was so peaceful. I really had to fight to come back. Now, those of you who know what near-death experience is like, it's just simply that, going into the love and light, which draws you in. Sadly, she died the next morning but I knew she'd seen something that day which gave her comfort and peace when she knew she only had hours to live. And I like this one particularly. I was nursing my friend who had definitely views that there was no afterlife. Do you remember? I said, it actually doesn't matter too much what you believe. In the last couple of hours, she became very peaceful and arose from her unconsciousness, periodically saying clearly and happily such phrases as, I will know soon. Come on, get on with it then. I'm ready to go now. And it's so beautiful. She would immediately lapse back into unconsciousness after uttering these phrases. She was very obviously content, happy, and at peace. It was a wonderful experience for her partner and me. So there you are. She's gone into uh, non dual consciousness and into the love and light of the universe. Uh, this is one patient series that uh, Monica Rents has, 80 patients. And look at the intensity of the work. Three observations a day. So you've got to go to this patient, three observations a day. And you rate them on four dimensions. Are they afraid? Are they in any pain? Do they recognize that they're dying? And tell us what their experiences are. Okay, so very good study. And from these observations, she's determined their level. So here we are. You can see this is patient 119, and this is the level. This is pre-transition, transition, post-transition. Post they go along. This is the cleaning period I was talking to you about. This is the losing of the egoic structures. And this is when they go into non-dual consciousness and into uh, transcendental bliss. Here's another one. Not everybody is like that. They go down into post-transition, transition, etc. But they come finally and go through this very wide cosmic feelings before they die in post-transition. Now, this graph is interesting. This is another one of Monica Rensis. And the yellow is almost no mild suffering. And this is moderate and much suffering. So you want to be in the yellow group. Well, if you look at that, you will see that some of them are quite high, in fact. So the highest one is the near-death experience. These people, um, I like to meditate, are meditators. And these ones have had previous mystical experiences. So that little bundle there, uh, go uh, die really quite easily and go into uh, have very little suffering. Um, there's, I, I like to pray again, 60%. And this one, I, I want to draw particularly to your attention, 63% with very little suffering. And their mental attitude is, I am curious about the afterlife. I am curious about the afterlife. Now, if you think about this, to be curious about something stops you being afraid. Very difficult to hold curiosity and, and fear. So you don't fear it. You're curious about the afterlife and you'll go through uh, smoothly. So what do we teach? That our end of life experiences, we explain them. Uh, we 
teach people how to give up their attachments. For example, one of the people that we met in, uh, it was a friend of ours actually in a hospice, and she said to us, who's going to look after my little car when I die? Now clearly, I doubt it was the car, I think it was her daughter, but that's an attachment and they all have to be given up. A number of mental attitudes can help meditation. And uh, you give confidence to people that 90% of conscious patients have positive transcendent experiences. It is enough to look forward to death and be curious. Now, I'm just going to show you that there is, it is very similar, dying is very similar and so I have here a list, I'm not going to go through it because it'd take too long, of the common elements recurring in the NDE, feelings of peace and quiet, uh, being out of the body, corroboration of events while out of the body, seeing adult tonality, spherical beings, all those sorts of things. So if we take the ones which really aren't, then these, these are the ones which uh, are very similar to the dying process. And this is what I wanted to see at the beginning, whether in fact the near-death experiences had in any way a similarity to dying. And the answer is yes, they do. So the similarity uh, between NDEs and dying gives us a better understanding of both the psychology and neurobiology of dying. This is some authors. Um, there is even a suggestion that we could use psychedelics to model it. And there's a group in, in Belgium that is in the process of seeking ethical approval to give the dying a small shot of ketamine. And that will take them very quickly to experience universal phenomena, doesn't last a lot long, and it will um, give them some feeling for what's, what's going to happen. And then by meditating on death, uh, we paradoxically become conscious of life. How extraordinary it is to be here at all. Awareness of death can jolt us awake to the sensuality of existence. So enjoy your existence before you die. Now, I want to end with a story. This is an old friend of ours, Professor Paul Robertson. Some of you may have heard him in the Medici Quartet. And Paul had an NDE some years before he died. There he is, uh, leader of the very sensitive man, lovely guy, uh, Medici Cortez. And uh, he went into hospital and there was a half hour operation to repair a tear in his aorta. His heart was stopped and his head cooled to protect his brain. And he's written a book about this. And in his book, Paul describes very clearly what he experienced while in this deeply unconscious state. And do listen to what Paul said the dying process is like. He was, he says, fully aware that he was dying. So he knew he was dying. And moving from this state to experience of the potential unification of his consciousness with that of the universe. As I lay there waiting, I felt, felt myself die beautifully ecstatically and transcendentally. I saw eternity and shed the whole of myself joyfully in order to become unified with it. Uh, really a most impressive experience. So why did Paul come back? It's because his um, family pulled him back by playing his CDs to him saying, don't leave us, don't leave us, Paul. So if people are going to die, let them die. So uh, I, when he came back, I had two years to discuss with Paul the whole process of dying and the changes in consciousness in that time. So when Paul actually died three years ago, his wife and family were with him. This time they were prepared and encouraged him to go. And his wife told me what happened. Paul woke up slightly from a deep sleep. He's probably unconscious actually. And told me, this is his wife speaking, I must let Peter Fennick know that there is nothing new. We've all been there before. And so, in fact, the dying process is very much uh, like those uh, that I've described to you. 
So in the final transition, there's the coupling of the ego, subject object con consciousness transforms to non-dual consciousness and all is a divine unity. So don't be afraid of dying, just be curious. As I lay there waiting, I felt myself beautifully die, beautifully, ecstatically, transcendentally. I saw eternity and shed the whole of myself joyfully in order to become unified with it. It would seem that we were never born and will never die. So guys, what are you all afraid of? Non-dual experiences arise as we die and become part of the cosmos. Non-dual also arise in people who've had the NDEs. So that's what I have to say about dying. I'd like to thank my um, colleague, Sue Brain, um, who herself actually has become non-dual. Hilary Lovelace, um, who's working in New Zealand. Inika, who works in Holland. Dr. Oliver McCallville, who works in Ireland. So thank you very much, and thank you for your attention. And here is my email.